Cool, hein? It's great to be here. Thank you so much, Elder Keith, for the welcome. Yes, Elder Archer. Yeah, so you, you know you'll never be out of work. You can make, you can make commercials with that voice. I'm sitting there listening to him reading that scripture reading. I didn't want to preach after that. He, he did so, he, you've got a fantastic voice. But he came, he came with Sister Cheryl to Hackney a few months ago and blessed her to for word. And for that we were so happy. And thank you. And he's quite right. I just want to thank my wife for looking after me. She looks after me so well. She does. She does. She's a blessing for God. I thank God for you. Hmm? You can see it. Absolutely. Amen. Okay. Now, someone said to me, is the sermon going to be short and sweet? I said, what, like me? She said, she said no, you're short. So I'm going to try and keep it very short and sweet, okay? But it's great to be here. So let's, let's, let's go and speak to the one who really matters. Okay, so I'm going to invite you to come with me as we put into your son and pray. Gracious Father, thank you once again for the opportunity to speak in the gap for you. I ask you now to wash me and cleanse me of anything which is unlike you so that your Holy Spirit can come and dwell within me. And you can use me, Lord, in any way you see fit to speak to the hearts of your people, to make changes in lives, and ultimately to bring glory to you. Amen. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Now, you know one of the hardest things to do is to take over from someone who's been successful. You know, it, it could be at work. You know what it's like? Someone who's had a position for so long and has excelled and made that position their own, and then they come and they put you in there. And you know you just ain't going to live up to it. It's hard because the person was the GOAT, the greatest of them all. How do you follow that? You, you look at for us football fans out there, you look at Manchester United. They have never been the same since Sir Alex left them. It's just so hard to follow someone with that measure of success. And so today, in the scripture reading, the greatest prophet Israel has ever known, the goat, prophet Elijah, has been taken, he's been translated. Swing low, them sweet chariots has come in forth and they've carried him home. And then... The young prophet, Elisha, has to follow that. He has to follow the man who stood on Mount Calman against all the prophets of Baal, and he stood alone. He has to follow the man who called fire down from heaven and devoured the, 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 the soldiers. He has to stand alone against the man who raised the dead. How do you follow Elijah? Well, this is how you follow Elijah by preparing yourself to follow Elijah. And what Elisha did, he said, I need a double portion. And he wasn't saying, I want to be quite a, 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 a double as good. Does that make sense, double as good? You have to forgive me, I come from Hackney. He, he doesn't want to be twice as good as Elisha. What he's saying is that I know how incapable I am. And so whatever Elijah had, I'm going to need double of that just to be able to stand next to him. So, so give me a double portion. So you know how to be successful is to, to prepare yourself, to know what you are and to know the, what the God you serve is and ask God for the things you need. The Bible says, if, if you need wisdom, ask God. 
who has it in abundance. So he says, Lord, I need something from you. And so he asks Elisha, and uh, Elijah said, well, if you're with me when I go, then it is yours. And you know, this young prophet follows this man. He will not let him go. They went to Gilgad, and Elijah says to him, stay here. And he says, no, sir. And he's following him. And they went to uh, 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 Jericho, and Elijah says, stay here. And he's following him. I'm leaving you. And everywhere Elijah went, he's not, go- he's not letting go. Because you've got to be serious about the things you want. You, you've got to be able to, to get on your knees and, and, and when they're saying to you, it's time to get up, say, I ain't getting up from this space until God blesses me because I know what I need from you. And so he follows him and he follows him. And then Elijah, as his last miracle, comes to the river Jordan, takes off his mantle and hits the water. And the water parts, elder, Part and, and the Bible says they cross on dry ground. You know when water has left somewhere, the ground is a bit muddy or a bit, you know, moist? When my God does something, he does it completely. They, they, they walked on dry, bone dry ground. And they crossed over. Uh, and Elisha is following this prophet around. And then swing low, them chariots come forth. Uh, and Elijah jumps on board. And he's taken, he's translated up into heaven. And, and, and Elijah says, my, my master, my master. He cries for him. And his mantle falls down. And this young prophet, green behind the ears, picks up the mantle of the great man. And he folds it up. And he walks back down to the river Jordan. And he says, where is the God of Elijah? Uh, Elijah's gone. I don't want Elijah. I want the God of Elijah. Moses is gone. I don't want Moses. I want the God of Moses. Daniel's gone. I don't want Daniel. I want the God of Daniel. You know, we follow people too much. Yeah, 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 people that can't help us. Don't be following people. Follow their God. I want the God of Elijah. I want the God that was with him when he stood on Mount Carmen. I want the God that was with him when he was depressed. I want the God that was with him when he outrun a chariot. Give me the God of Elijah. And he takes the mantle. How's about this for your first miracle? (laughs) Can you imagine? He takes the mantle and he hits the Jordan. And the Bible says the Jordan parted. And he walked over on dry ground. And then all the prophets looked at him and said, The spirit of Elijah is on Elisha. Did you hear that? You ought to be saying something. Because that's what we need. We need that, you know, especially in this day and age that we live in. It. God's people ought to have a spirit about them. That when people see you, they will know that the spirit of the living God is within you. And that's how we... God is calling for people who will be lights in this dark age. I, I can't understand us. Because we live in serious times. I heard my brother's prayer here. He said people are walking around with swords and things. I live in Hainu. You heard on the news a couple of weeks ago, this young boy, Daniel, uh, uh, what's his name, man? Thanks, honey. This boy is murdered, got on his way to school. You know, you should be able to send your kids to school and expect them to come home. We're living in dangerous time. And God's people seem to have just taken off their armor like we're living in peace time. I heard in your Bible study today, someone saying that we're, we're in war. Would you people need to take off your civilian clothes and get your soldier clothes on? Because there's a war going on. Anyway, let's get to the message. So, anyway, Elijah is on fire for the Lord. 
Elisha then goes and he, he purifies the spring of, of bitter water. He then goes and he has this unfortunate situation where some children was calling him, was taking, taking, uh, taking the mickey out of his alopecia. You know, you know, Elder, one time, there are, let me tell you this, one time I was in Hackney, I was preaching in Hackney, I'm sitting on the platform, they called for the children's story, and the sister who comes to do the children's story, of all the stories in the Bible to tell to little children, she tells the children, she tells the story of the children taking the mickey out of Elisha, Elisha's bald head and how the she-bears come out and devoured 42 children. The poor little children are like this. And here's the thing, here's the thing. When children's story finish, I have to stand up with my bald head and preach. <laughs> and the children just looking at me. And, and what, because I'm laughing, because I, I just thought it was so funny. So I stand up there and I'm, I look at the children like this. Hmm, any of them on it dare say anything about my, my bald head. But anyway, this is what Elisha does. Elisha then hails the, the widow of Zeropath. He tells her she's going to have a child. She has the child, uh, and then the child dies a little while later. He brings the child back to life. There's a time where, where they were cooking some, something in the pot, and, and somebody, says, <laughs> somebody says, Master, there's death in the pot. Can you imagine you cook? Can you imagine putting you? You done cook something and somebody tastes it and says, there's death in the pot. And Elisha says, bring me some meal. He puts some meal in it and heals it. He, the man is on fire for the Lord. He's on fire. And that is what God's calling people to be. On fire for him today. Uh, and now he runs the school of the prophet in Gilgal and, and Jericho and Bethel. It's a proper school, you know, where they train people for the gospel. Where they train people to go out and tell people of the soon coming king. Not like these schools where we send our kids today. I'm so glad that our, my children are grown boy. I wouldn't know where to send them. I'd have to homeschool them and I don't know nothing to teach them. But can you imagine? I would, I would, I would be... You know, there was a time in school where they taught them about the birds and the bees, remember? Now, now they teach them about the, the birds and the birds. <laughs> and the bees and the bees. And the birds that used to be bees, but now they're birds. <laughs> and the bees that identify as birds, but they still have their stingers. <laughs> Can you imagine? How do you know where to send your children? But he's, he's, he's running the school of the prophets where they treat, they're teaching solid doctrines. But this school, one of these schools, is, is a bit small. It, 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 it's packed out. They haven't got enough room to move. So, one of the sons of the prophet says to Elisha, you know, this place is too small for us. It's too cramped. We need to do something about this space. But he doesn't just point out the problem, Yudali. He, he has a solution. And that's where we find the imbalance in the church. Because so many of us uh, are so quick to point out the problems. Oh, this is wrong. This is, you know, sometimes you come to church on Sabbath. You go home with a headache. People just moan and they moan and they grow. Yeah, but nobody comes up with a suggestion or solution. They just point out problems. But this young prophet says, the place is too small, but I've got a solution. Why don't we go down to the Jordan where there's loads of trees there because there's no B&Q, there's no builder's merchant. If you want wood, you have to go, go fetch your own wood. Let's go down there and we can cut down some trees. And make some wood, and we can build somewhere bigger. And the prophet Elisha says, That's a great idea, guys. Go. But then they say, No, 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 no. It's not, it's not enough for us to go. We want the presence of the man of God with us. Come on, somebody. 
you, you know, there's two things. Sometimes our leaders will, will just bless it. Go, 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 do it. But no, no, it's good to have your leaders going out with you. And it's good to have the man of God with you because, you know, when something go wrong, you want the man of God there with you. So they say to Elisha, come with us. And Elisha says, yeah, yeah, okay, guys, I'll come. And this man who is on fire from the Lord he goes out with these guys. And they get to the place at, 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 the, at the Jordan and they start to chop down some trees. Now, like I said, you need an axe. Now, an axe is not like we have axe now. You can go and get axe ten a penny. In them days, they had to be frauds by the blacksmith. As a matter of fact, when we look back in the time of King Saul, they, didn't even, they, they weren't allowed, the Philistines didn't allow them to, to forge their own weapons. If you go to war, they had to go with their, their forks and their hoes and things like that. And there's only two swords in Israel at one time. So an axe is a precious thing. A blacksmith has to put it together. But axes were different from axes we have now. Um... If you go to the shops now, you can get an axe with a lovely, welded, molded head. So it's all one piece. But in them days, you had the axe, the metal bit, and you had the heft or, or, or the handle, if you like. And the, the, the head had to be tied either with the bark, strips bark of a tree, or if you're lucky and you have some good rope, you do it some rope. Or if you haven't got that, you, have, you just use some cloth. You, you make strips of cloth and you tie it up and you tie it as tight as you can. That's all well and good, but the problem is, it's susceptible to coming off. Because the more you use it, the weaker it goes, and at some stage it could come off. As a matter of fact, when the children of Israel went into the land of Canaan, God told them, it may be, it may be possible that sometimes, whilst doing some stuff, you kill someone by accident. And if you do so, I've made provision for that. I've got six cities of refuge, uh, three on the east of Jordan, three on the west of Jordan. If you kill someone, there's something called the avenger of blood. You know, you know, you know the story, yeah? The avenger of blood means if I kill someone, his brother or his father, his relative, has a right to come and take my life. But if I can get to one of those six cities, hallelujah, someone, I, I can have refuge. And I can stay there and be safe until the high priest died. Isn't it good that God says he will make a way for us. He will always have a refuge. God is our refuge and our strength, our very present help in a time of trouble. Even when we're out of order, God makes a way for us. So anyway, God said, so how do you kill someone accidentally? Listen to this. Um, if we go to Deuteronomy chapter... 19 Deuteronomy chapter 19 listen to what listen to what it says here stay with me this is what God says God says when a man goes into the woods with his neighbor to cut wood and his hand fetches a stroke with the axe to cut down a tree and the head slips from the heft and, and hits his neighbor and he dies that man shall flee into one of those cities and live you see the story here so so an uh, axe head flying off was not an uncommon thing because of the construction of it. So God used that example. God says an accidental death could be that. When you're chopping down a tree and as you fling the axe head flat, fly off, lick someone in the head and he dies. Then you can run to the city. So it's a common occurrence that when you're using an axe head, you have to be careful. Well, back to the story. They're down at the River Jordan. And this young prophet is chopping away. Uh, and he's, he's, he's getting his tree and maybe they're singing the song, small axe, chop down big tree. Oh, 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 oh. I know none of you know them, them kind of songs anyway. But, but, but there was a song like that. Uh, uh, but they're chopping away. And as this guy goes to take the thing, what happens? What happens? The head fly off. But it doesn't lick somebody. 
it goes flying and you hear a big almighty splash. The head falls in the Jordan. Now the Jordan is deep and the Jordan is mucky. And this young prophet, he goes to Elisha and he says, Alas, my master, oh no! Not only have I lost the axe, because if you're chopping down a tree and you lose your axe, you might as well go home. You've got nothing doing there. You cannot fulfill what you're there to do. But he, that's not his only problem. His problem is the axe was borrowed. This young man, he's broke. He got nowhere to live. He borrowed something. Now he's lost it. Now he's in debt. He has to find a way to pay back the person for the axe because axes are expensive. What do what, what you do? You know what it's like when you lose something that's not yours? It's bad when you lose something that is yours. You feel terrible. Imagine someone borrow you something. They borrow you their mobile. You lose it or, or, or something like that. It, it, it's terrible. You have this, 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 this sense of, of disgust. There's this woman who's flying home from holiday. And she has her dog in a basket, in a cage. So she goes to the reception and she says, Lady, can I book my dog you know, on, on the seat on the plane, please, next to me? And the lady says, No, 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 that's not our policy. Animals must always go in the hole. Don't worry, we've got a place, special place for animals. We keep them, we'll keep it safe. The lady says, No, please, this, this dog is so precious to me. I'm, I, I just need him safe next to me. It's covered over. The lady says, no, sorry. It's policy. You have to put him in the hole. So reluctantly, she gives it over, puts him in the hole. Flies the plane, lands, comes out, gets her luggage. She's ready to go. She says, uh, my dog? Oh yeah, we'll get it for you. They go, they can't find the dog. The lady starts, what do you mean you can't find it? Oh, yeah, we, we know it's there, we, we, we'll find it. They go, look, they look half an hour, they can't find it. The lady's going to spare. It escalates. They call the manager, the manager comes, what's that? They've lost my dog, I need my dog, blah, blah, she's going on. The, the manager says, madam, I promise you, I will find that dog. If the dog was put on there, I will find it. Madam, go home, give us your address. When I find the dog, I will personally bring the dog to you. So she, she's, she feels good about that. She goes home. The man goes looking for the dog. They can't find the dog. Two hours later, they can't find the dog. What they've actually done, they've transferred the dog to an ongoing flight going somewhere else. But just as they're about to put it on the plane, they notice and they find it and they run and say, no, 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 don't give, give us that. They take the basket. Oh, thank you, thank you. This belongs to the lady. They, they take the cover off it, they look, and the dog's dead. <laughs> what do you do? Eh? You've lost something that didn't belong to you. The, the manager feels terrible. What am I going to say to this lady? He's looking at this dog. Then he comes up with a bright idea. That's what managers do. He says, I'm going to replace the dog. He looks at the dog, he takes a picture of the dog, he sends it around to all these dog shops. Have you got a dog like this? No, 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 no. Eventually, someone says, yeah, we've got a dog who looks just like this. Uh, where are you? I'm two hours away. Don't sell the dog. I'm coming. The man drives two hours one way. He looks at the dog, yes, it's got the thing on the thing, on the right patch, it looks fine. The dog's wagging its tail, it's licking his hand, that's a friendly dog. I'll have it. He pays for it, drives it back. Take out the dead dog, gets rid of the dead dog, yeah, puts it in the basket, covers it over. He puts the collar on the dog, so everything. She'll never know. Do you think she'll know? They, they, drive, they drive to the woman's house. He, he, he comes in, lady, we found your dog. She goes, oh, thank you so much. She's elated. He, he takes, he says, there it is. He takes the cover off. The lady says, that ain't my dog. Straight away she knows. He goes, how do you know that in your dog? He goes, she says, because my dog's dead. <laughs> my, I, I, I was bringing my dog. My dog died on holiday. I'm bringing him home to bury it. <laughs> Unless big dog is named Lazarus, this can't be my dog. So where's my dog? The, because you know what it's like when you lose something that don't belong to you. You feel you have an obligation to, to do whatever 
to replace, to put right that wrong. And this young prophet, he knows he's lost the man's axe. And he wants to do whatever is possible within his power to, to retrieve the axe. But the axe is gone in the water and the Jordan's deep. You know what we like with water? We, we use it appropriately. We drink it, Tina. We do what we have to, but, but we don't stay too, too long in water. Especially deep water. You know, my wife and I was on this, on this cruise. We were up on deck watching these young ladies, you know, selfies and all that, taking all this thing. The, the poor girl, she put the thing on the rail. She's there like this. The phone just right down in the middle of the med or whatever. I, the girl's face. Ah, she scream out. Do you know, because there's something about water, deep water. There's nothing you can do. When you lose things. My friend, he got married and he went to St. Lucia. Boy, it's bad. Tina. At least you can say amen, Tina. Scream it out. He went to, all right, he went to Jamaica. Oh. Goodness gracious. What? Mercy. All right, we'll pretend he went to Jamaica, right? And the things you have to do in Wilsden to get an amen. He went to Jamaica. Amen. What am I saying? He went, he went to St. Lucia on his honeymoon. And he's out there. My friend, is, he's got really bad eyesight and he's, he wears really thick glasses. Him and his wife, they went out in the boat in the middle of the beautiful Caribbean Sea because there's no sea like St. Lucian Sea. There's no beach <laughs> like St. Lucian <laughs> Yeah, they, they always tell me, preach it sermon like it's your last, like you'll never come back. <laughs> so anyway, he's out in the middle of the sea and they're, they're looking over the sides and the man's glasses fell off. Now he needs, his, his, he's got really bad eyesight. And he, he tries to grab it and the thing just floats down, 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 in, right down into the Caribbean Sea. He said to me, John, I wanted to dive in, but I can't swim. I was as desperate. So they, they, they get back to shore and his wife says, don't worry, we'll go to the opticians and, and we'll get you sorted out. So they went there, the people tested his eyes. Yes, yes, said, we can get the glasses. Yeah, you'll have it in three weeks' time. But he's only there for two weeks. So he's distraught. He's, he doesn't know what to do. And he says, because it was water, because when you lose things in water, you just feel like it's not your domain. And this young prophet doesn't know what to do. So he goes and he calls on the man of God and he says, I've lost it. I've lost this thing that don't belong to me. Because many times we lose things that don't belong to us. We lose our children and we, I've lost my child. Blah, 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 blah. The child didn't belong to you. You're a steward for that child. God expects you to look after that child. I've lost my health because of, of, of immoral living. It's not your health. It belongs to God. Your body belongs to him. I've lost my virginity. It wasn't your virginity, honey. It's God's. We need to get to understand that everything we have, we are stewards of. He goes to the man, I've lost it. And it didn't belong to me. You know, the axe head has no use at the bottom of the Jordan. When you lose things that has purpose, that thing is devoid of the purpose it was created for. It's in the Jordan and it has no use at all. Well, when you lose what God gives you, you lose the purpose of the reason God gave you that gift. God has blessed us. And from the time you accept Jesus, he blesses you with something. You've got some kind of spiritual gift. Don't be saying you ain't got nothing. When the woman comes to Elisha and says, I've got nothing in my house. He, except, except, except a, 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 a bottle of oil. Oh, so you have got something. God always gives you something. 
And so you, you, if you don't use it, you're going to lose it. And when you lose it, it has no purpose. It has no value. The best way to make use of what God has given you is to use it to his glory. I've lost it, Elisha. What shall I do? You know, but when, when we find ourselves in deep water, sometimes it's easy to give up because the man could have just sat down on the riverbed bank and watch other people work. But, you know, don't allow your circumstance to dictate your life. Circumstances come and they go. Circumstance ain't your life. We wallow too much sometimes in our sorrow. And don't get me wrong, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying to downplay your sorrow because I know what sorrow is. But, but sorrow is not the be all and end all. Believe me, that too shall pass. You're going to be able to hold on to God in your time of sorrow. You're going to be able to tell God how you feel. Lord, I, I've lost that thing and I can't function without it. I need you to come in and do something for me right now. He goes to the man of God. I, I lost my master. I've lost it. That, you know, Elisha could have said, what are you telling me for? The reason I'm telling you, Elisha, because I know you part the Jordan. Yeah, I know you raised the dead. I know the spirit of the living God reigns in you. Don't be wasting your time going to people whose God, whose the spirit of God is not in. Find the person. Find the person where the spirit of God resides. That person can go to the throne of grace in your time of trouble. And Elijah says to him, Elisha says to him, something bizarre. Uh, he went to Jordan. Elisha says, where did it fall? <laughs> where, did it, where did it fall? It fell in the water. What do you mean, where did it fall? Where did it fall? There's something there. Because many times we lose stuff. And we don't know where we lost it. My marriage has dissolved. Where did it go wrong? I don't know. Why don't you know? My child has gone AWOL. Where, where, did, your, where did your child start to turn? I don't know. Why don't you know? My health is failing. Where, at what stage? What was your lifestyle? What, what happened to make your health start failing? I don't know. We are too ignorant of our own situations. Elijah says to him, where did it fall? The man was not able to stop the axe head falling in the water. But what he did, he watched it. As it was falling, his eyes followed it. And he was able to say to the prophet, it fell on that spot. That's where it went wrong. That's where I lost it. And we need to be aware. We need to have some self-awareness of our situations in life that we can trace back and say, that's where I lost it. And then, Elisha sees it in that place, goes and cuts a stick and throws it right on the spot where the man says. And then, the Bible says, and the axe floated up. You know what's the matter with us? We have got too complacent in the word of God. Because if you understood that, you should all be up on your feet saying glory, hallelujah, because acts don't float. But we, we've heard it so many times, and that's the problem with us. We, uh, familiarity has bred contempt. An axe floated somebody. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. It's, it, it, that is an impossible thing 
to happen. The science doesn't, doesn't prove it. Is there any science teachers here? You ever see an axe float in water, Mrs. Science teacher? It just doesn't happen. And the reason it doesn't happen is to do with density and water density. Now, did you say there's a science teacher here? If I get this wrong, don't help me out. Now, it's to do with water density. Now, the density of water is that one cubic square, so one cubic centimeter of water. So if you think of an ice cube, that's a centimeter cubic. One cubic centimeter of water weighs one gram. That's the density proportion. Is that right, science teacher? Absolutely. So for something to float in water, it has to have the same density or less than water. For example, wood. Wood has the density of 0.3 to 0.9, depending on what kind of wood it is. So whenever you drop wood in water, it will float. Some better than others, depending on the density. Human beings, our density is... Our density is the same as water. That's why most of us can swim, can float in water. However, compressed metal like an axe, do you know what the density of it is? Have a guess. Who said that? How do you know that? You're absolutely right. 7.7. 7. 7 times the density of water. A compressed thing. Now you may say, how come ships float? Seems ships float because they decompress it, they beat it out, beat out the metal to allow airflow. But if it's compressed, it's 7.7. 7. And it, if you drop something 7.7 7 in something that's the density of one, it's only going one way, and that is south. So when the prophet of the Lord takes a stick and throws it in the water and the axe head floats, we ought to be saying, Hallelujah! Thank you, Jesus! I serve a God who's mighty to save. I serve a God who's not restricted by the laws of nature. He's a God of impossibilities. And God wants us to, to try him. He says, Test me. Let me show you how powerful I am. You know, it's like driving a Ferrari at, at 20 miles an hour all the time. And the Ferrari is saying to you, what are you doing? When are you going to test me? When are you going to push me and see what I can do? You know, we, we put God in a box. We ask God to do little things that we know or we think that he can do. But God is saying, I am mighty to save. I am not restricted by any laws. I'm not restricted by kinetic laws or the laws of energy or inertia laws. You know, oh, oh, oh tell, me, tell, tell me some laws. The, the laws of gravity. I am beyond that. And, and the reason why us, especially as as good old seven-day Adventist people, the reason why we don't excel in certain areas is that we restrict God. We serve a mighty God. A God that says, give me something impossible. Because there's nothing that is too hard for me to do. I am God all by myself. Test me. And Elisha knows that. That's why we need some more than day Elishas today who can say that my God can do something about an impossible situation. Throw the stick in and watch the iron float. No laws. Laws of science, the laws of maths, you know, we have the uh, 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 laws of relativity. What is it? E equals mc squared. Only because Ironside, what's his name? Not Ironside, what's his name? Einstein. Einstein, Ironside. Einstein was the man in the wheelchair, wasn't he? 
<laughs> showing my age, but Einstein. Only because Einstein says so. But if God says E equals something else, then that's what it is. Absolutely. You know, we have all our laws, you know, uh, uh, all our formulas. X equals minus B plus or minus square root of B squared minus 4AC over 2A. Quadratic equation when I was at school anyway. But, but only if God says so. Because God is beyond everything. So, so your impossible situation, give it to him. And, but, we, but we stay in it because we, we judge God by our standards. Oh no, that's too hard. That's too hard. Uh, and that's why we see other denominations flying high. Because they are giving God the impossible. So... Elijah makes the axe head float and he says to the man, reach out and get it. You know, it's amazing. If he could make it float, he could make it land right back here, couldn't he? But God won't do what you can do. You understand? The man can reach out and get it. Let him do that. Let God do what God can do and you can't. But what you can do you do it. Because God works in impossible ways. So, my friend, my friend, who's lost his glasses, is miserable. This is his honeymoon. Two weeks in St. Lucia, uh, and, and uh, you can't see nothing. You can't see the pitons. You, you, you can't see our beautiful water. You can't go on our lovely beaches. You can't go down our marketways and places and see them beautiful colors all around. He, he, he's virtually blind. But, but he, serves a he, 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 he has a mother who serves a living God. He has a mother who believes and has proved God for herself. And so whilst he's in St. Lucia, he phones his mom and he tells his mom the bad news. And his mom says to him, when have you prayed about it? He said, but mom, the, the glasses is in the middle of the Caribbean Sea. Yeah, that's not what I asked you. I said, have you prayed about it? Well, no, because well, it's impossible. Yeah, are you listening to me, church? Because that's how we are. We only pray to God about things that we deem possible. And we don't give God the, the credit that he is as God. So him and his wife went and started to pray about it. The man said, I'll be praying, you pray about it. He prayed about it. So what are you expecting? The, someone to knock on his door and say, here's your glasses? No. The next day, the spirit tells him to hire one of the boatmen and ask him to take him out to sea. That he does. Gets the boat out to sea. I want to try and find my glasses. Yeah, you, you have every right to laugh. Absolutely. Because it's diabolical. So the, he says, whereabouts? Somewhere here. So he asks the guy, because he can't swim, would you mind <laughs> just <laughs> diving in and see if you, if you see anything? The guy looks like him. You English people, you English people, stupid. So, so he says, just, just, just do it, I'll pay you. So the guy dives in, has a little swim around with his snorkel, whatever, comes up. No, no, there's not over there. Did you see anything? Yeah, I see fishy, I see coral. No glasses. Do you mind having another look? I pay you. You know St. Lucian. Once you see the green stuff. Yeah, okay. Dive down again. Swim around a little bit longer. Come back. The guy says to him, what do, you, do you expect me to see one of the fish wearing your glasses or something like that? There's nothing down there, man. You're wasting your time. You're wasting my time. You're wasting your money. Forget it. 
Wayne says, please try one more time. Just one more time. Because he's been praying to a God that does the impossible. The guy rolls his eyes, dies down back there again, Elder Keith, looks around, has a swim around, comes back up. Is this your glasses? Oh, c come on, church. He comes up with the man's glasses. Comes up with Wayne's glasses. Only a God who specializes in the impossibilities of life can do something like that. And if God cares enough about Wayne's glasses, about, about the prophet's axe head that didn't belong to him, God cares about your situation. God is in tune with you. All he wants you to do is believe and ask him. Ask him to do the impossible. Let God come through in your life for you. That's the God you serve. And that's, that's when, you know, we worry about going out and telling people about Jesus and giving people tracks and steps to cross and all them, them things have its place. But when you can tell people your story, when Wayne can go to work and tell his boss about his glasses story and that Jesus found it in the depths of the Caribbean Sea, people have to look at your God differently. That's what God does. That's what God does. He specializes in that. And 2,000 years ago, when we uh, as the human race uh, was lost in the depths of the sea of sin, an uh, uh, impossible situation where we, we were condemned to die and nothing and no one could save us. It was Jesus that came along and, and cut down that tree. But it wasn't a stick. It was the old rugged cross. And threw it into the depths of the, 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 the sea of sin. And one by one, all those who believed floated up to the top and that we might have life and have it more abundantly. Hallelujah, somebody. And he's the same God. The same God of Elijah. Same God of Elisha. The same God of Wayne. The same God is able to float your axe head today. Absolutely. Same God. So my time's up. But God wants to do someone. Something for someone. So, uh, Tina, if you could play something for us, please. Any, anything. And we're going to pray. We're going to put our impossible situation to the God of possibilities. Yeah, we, we, we're going we're gonna to challenge God because there's no challenge to our God. We're going to give him something a little more than what we've been giving him. You know, that impossible thing that everybody tells you you're crazy. Oh, yeah. Give it to my God. Anyone know this song? What song is this? Can someone sing this for us? What is it? All to Jesus. Ah, oh, that's the song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the one. Not some. Not some to Jesus. I want you to think of that thing in your life that everybody says is impossible to do. Yeah, yeah, that healing, that, that, that relationship restoration, that taking you back to where you need to be on your spiritual plane, that impossible financial situation that you're in. Come on and surrender it to Jesus. I want to surrender it, not some of it, I want to surrender all. And if that's you, I'm just going to ask you to come here to the foot of the cross. Surrender it to Jesus and, and watch Jesus move in your life. All to him. All to be my God who's able to float my axe. I want to surrender it all. 
all to Jesus, all to Jesus. Yeah, they said to you, that could never happen. They said to you, that relationship is finished. They said your health is done. You're, you're only going one way. My God is able to float your acts. He's not limited by the laws of nature. Neither can he be. Because he is God. Surrender to him, I surrender. Believe that he's able to do exceedingly, abundantly, more than you could ever ask. If you surrender it to him. surrender all. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. And our hearts are lifted to the throne of grace where we know and we believe we can find help in our times of trouble. Our most gracious God that that allows us to call you Father as unworthy as we are. We just want to thank you that you are God, all powerful, that you're the God who stands on nothing and says, let there be and there is. You're the God who commands and it stands still. You're a God who has said, is anything too hard for me to do? Father God, we are your children. But living in this sinful world like we do, where the prince of darkness seems to reign, he sometimes distorts your image. And he makes us look at you as we look at our fellow man with, with restrictions. And Father God, that's why we have never prayed like, like you want us to pray. We've never gone to you believing that you can do the impossible because we see you father god in our in, in our infinite minds but father god in the name of jesus we're asking you right now to break down that stronghold clear the fog from our minds let us see you in the beauty of holiness let us understand that you have the whole world in your hand. Let us know that it is you who said, cast all your care upon me. Not just because I am omnipotent. Not just because I am all powerful. But because I care for you. Father God, we stand here. Before our impossible situations, you know what they are, Father. Look on the hearts of your people. Things that people told us to give up on. Things that we ourselves have given up on. But Father God, we ask you to forgive us for putting you in a box. Forgive us for putting a ceiling on you. Forgive us for restricting you by our own expectations, our own laws. Because you're a God which is beyond us. You're a God who is not restricted by time or space or matter or energy. You are God all by yourself. And Father God, many of us have lost our axe heads. And we just don't know how to get them back. Axe heads of finances, axe heads of relationships, axe heads of health, axe heads of mental health, axe heads of, of, of feeling frustrated because we just, uh, we, we, we just lost our sense of self-esteem and our self-pride. We've, we've lost it, Lord, and we don't know how to get it back. 
but we want to thank you that you remind us that you are truly God and you can resurrect our situations today we are calling on the God of Elijah and Elisha the God that is not bound by anything neither can he be and the God who cares about us so much that he says when you cast your cares upon me I will take care of your business and we're asking you in Jesus name that you will come through father and you will reach down in the mucky Jordans of our life find our axe head that is lodged in some steep mud that is down in the depths of the sea and we ask you in Jesus name that you will dislodge it father and you will allow it to float up right up to the surface where we can sit and we can say hallelujah thank you Jesus and then father we ask you that you will help us to just reach out and reclaim that that has been restored by our God and help us oh father to walk with newness of life with our acts it will be our testimony to tell people I carry this axe because of what Jesus has done for me and it is no secret what God can do what he's done for others he'll do for you let us be light shining in the darkness to proclaim to the world that Jesus still saves thank you for being our God of impossibilities. Thank you for being our loving God. We ask you now that you will walk with us and teach us to daily surrender it all to you, knowing that in your hands our acts head is safe. We praise you, we honor you, we love you, and we thank you, and we pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ our Savior. Let all those who believe say, Amen. Amen. I surrender all. I surrender all.